have had around the world. As the global voice of CX, and we're going to get to what that means. My real goal is to reveal some truths about our industry, the customer experience industry, that are otherwise unheard or unsaid. And I'll just give you a little backstory for some context. So I started out my career in this industry performing customer experience strategy. I performed strategy for Wells Fargo, FedEx, AT&T, McDonald's, to name a few. And to be honest, it was going pretty well. But then I got exposed to this guy. This guy's name is Rashid Tafi. He is the Deputy Director General of the Western Cape South African Government. And Rashid told me about an impact to our industry that I had never thought of before. He talked about the effect that call center jobs have on the families and the children and the communities in which they exist. And how important it was for us to not just focus on the technology or the solutions or the CSAT scores, but to bring forward the stories of the front lines and to make a difference in these families. And of course, at that time, I was like, why are you telling me this stuff, Rashid? And he said, because I think with your audience, you can do this. And so I said, all right. So he started introducing me to people like Vuyo, an agent. And so I got to know her story. He introduced me to this other lady, Leanne, who owns a bunch of hotels and employs agents that used to be agents, but employs people as customer experience professionals, providing services. And from there, I, I met another woman, Sunshine. Sunshine works in her community to uplift the children in her community by giving them a sense of pride in an environment where otherwise there wouldn't be any. That led me to this, this guy, Frampton. All right, so hear me out about Frampton and customer experience. Why am I telling you about this guy? This picture is taken in the city called Guguletu. Guguletu has a murder every 48 hours. There's no police, there's no fire services, there's no ambulances, and there's no white people except for this one. And I went out there to film these stories because we have to remember that people who create products are no different than the people in this room. And what's interesting about the human kind is their resilience and their innovation. And it doesn't matter where you are. These stories exist. And Frampton is a perfect example. If, if you're familiar with those, many of you probably had uh, pallets, wooden pallets that you carried your goods in to this place. He finds those in the trash along the side of the road and he turns those wood pallets into this stuff. These are made out of wood pallets at the side of the road. This is how he provides for his family. You all are in an industry where you are expected to learn and innovate and survive and create. But I'm just gonna ask you, people who do this, they're creating experiences that matter, okay? So if you can imagine, this is the context of which, where I came into this idea that I needed to come here and tell you these stories. But meanwhile, the other work that I was doing was with this woman, Alice Marie Johnson. Does anybody know who Alice Marie Johnson is? I, this was on the set. I was working on a, a documentary with Alice Marie Johnson and Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian went to the president and asked to get Alice Marie Johnson pardoned from prison. And she was. She spent her last five years, six years now, helping people who are in the midst of experiences that are unjust. So when we think about experiences, they're more than just technology, performance, statistics. 
experiences are about human, the human being. This guy, does anybody know who this guy is? Does anybody know who Snoop Dogg is? This is Snoop Dogg's partner, Harry O. Snoop Dogg and Harry O create different kinds of experiences. Okay, all this to say, there's no difference between you and Harry O and Frampton and this guy. This guy, Clint. Met this guy, Clint. Clint was the first guy I ever met who actually solved how to quantify customer experiences. This guy right here. I've talked to hundreds, thousands of people around the world. I have one more show in the US before I start my world tour for the rest of this year. This is the only guy in the world that I ever met who solved how to actually quantify customer experiences and build them up within an organization. Here's the guy in your industry. I met this guy, Joey. He creates tours around countries that include food, music, and the like. So, all of these people um, are creating experiences, but they're no different than us. And so I just ask us all to just take a step back when you're here at the show today and you're pitching your wares or you're looking for your next solution or you're looking for a reason to buy or a value proposition, just remember these people are all part of the human experience of which we're all part of. So that put me on a mission. That, I'm a, this is going to be my third year of a world tour doing this. And I'm meeting people in the industry that you should be looking at, things that you should be paying attention to, and I'm going to tell you about them now. And then I'm going to show you some cool videos so you don't have to watch me speak. This guy, Ladislau, met this guy, he's in Dubai. Dubai is the only place in the world where the government has a happiness metric. A happiness metric that it expects all of its people and all of its companies to meet. This happiness metric is standardized in their country. What does that mean to us? Most CX, uh, most CX initiatives fail because customer care and marketing don't speak the same language. There's no standardization. Without CX standardization, there cannot be unity in our development as a industry. This guy is pioneering it. They have international standards to find. They have curriculums that have just gone into place in the universities in Europe. So if you're not following the international standards, it's something you're gonna to wanna to talk, you're gonna to wanna to look into. I'm gonna highlight for you a story that is debuting here. I have two stories debuting. This one, Nadia. Nadia and I spoke. Nadia is the head of Expo City Dubai, both figuratively and literally. The most futuristic experience in the world. And they are creating and innovating in ways that we can barely even imagine. And I'm gonna show you a video about this. So, as a leader, she doesn't answer the phone. She doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't uh, do the marketing. She leads a team that develops the most outstanding futuristic thinking experiences in the world. And one of the people, to give you an example, on our team is this guy, Ahmed. Ahmed designed a city around the human and customer experience. Every single step, inch, doorway, breezeway, light, and you're gonna see it. When you see the city he built, you're gonna say, damn, now that's how you build a city. He engineered this city so that in the different times of the year, the weather, the breeze flows in between the buildings according to the weather patterns. To, to compensate for the heat in Dubai. So that's pretty spectacular. I'm gonna talk about this, this person. Here's a call center lady. She owns a call center. She has agents. Why is that awesome? Well, because one, she's part of our human collective and the experiences that matter. In her call center, what I found, 
because I've traveled to many of them, is in her call center, she has a whole team of agents who are deaf. All of these agents are deaf, an entire team. Everyone has a role to play in this experience economy. That this guy, I think Jim's here, E-Tech is here, this guy, Matt Rocco, I went out to uh, an American call center. I wanted to see what it was like in the call center industry in the United States. When here, this guy is all about servant leadership. And you know, I, I hear a lot of sales pitches. You're gonna hear a lot of them today. They are what they are, but I go to the source to hear these stories, to find out what the truth is. And I'm gonna bring you some truths in these videos. This guy, I met his agents, I talked to his agents, I learned about the importance of servant leadership. He embodies it, so servant leadership, building up families, decreasing crime, giving opportunities to people who don't have them, all things that we all do amidst this. And so I just, what I leave you with all of that introduction, and now we're gonna to get to the fun stuff, is to say, please know that there's more to, more to CX than what we see and what we talk about. Because while many of us will think that this is the world of customer experience, it comes from a place that, that starts here and we're all connected. All right, that's the context of the global voice of CX. I want to talk about um, some universal truths of CX, but before I do that, I'm going to show you a video. This video was probably the most important start of my journey, and I'm happy to say Neil Top is here. Say hi, Neil. <clears throat> I didn't plan for Neil to be here, but he is, and I'm glad. I wanted to tell the stories of the frontline agents. Not a lot of people let you have access to the frontline agents. They don't just let you walk in there with the camera and start asking questions. I trusted that Neil ran a good place and he was doing good things for the people in his business. But then I threw him a curveball and I said, hey Neil, why don't you let me go to Africa and help my boy Rashid out and try to learn about this African call center story. And Neil said, I'm in. And what I went and found was this, and I'll just let the agents tell you what it's like to be an agent on the front line all the way out in a small city called East London in Africa. Oh, hold on. Oh, could you hear that? Where's the sound guy? Sound guy. <laughs> All right, hold on. I've, I've, I've seen this happen to other speakers in other events. I got you. Sound guy's like dying right now. Oh, there's no jacket. Yeah. But I was ready. I mean, the show must go on. I'll self narrate it if I have to. Alright. Back to where we were. Alright, here we go. Alright, let's hear from this gentleman. I'm not hearing it. Being a customer service representative or as an agent means essentially helping where I can. One thing I've learned so far with working with people is that you will get to meet different kind of people, like different attitudes, different behaviors. Also, that makes you grow as a person because you get to understand yourself as well. We have the best combination of people. They are very friendly, skilled, sympathetic, and patient. Those things put together create the most amazing quality for customer service.
here we are at a customer care representative's house in East London and she's going to show us around. Okay, so this is my house. This is where we stay, eat, cook and everything. And then I go to this room and this is where I go. How can I help you today? I was unemployed, <laughs> so I was in my bed. I'm just like scrolling. I saw this job opportunity that you must have a laptop, Wi Fi, and everything. I was like, what do I have to lose? And then I applied on the same day, <laughs> on the same day later. And then I get this zip zip on my phone. Here's a Zoom code. Remember, I have a meeting the next day. So I was like, That's, this is a scam. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? What do I have to lose? I didn't really pay much attention to it. I was like, I don't really know. About call centers and especially remote call centers, how would that even work? My mother at first, she was not sure because she thought that it meant that I need to go to Colombia. I had to sit her down, uh, talk to her about what's going on and all that. When I told my parents, it was very unbelievable to them. Like, dude, you're gonna work at home? Stop it. That's not something that's possible. You need to get out there and find a job. After training, it was my first time doing something like this. The company that I started with would get more than 20 calls a day. I was so nervous. Every time I would get a call, my heart would jump. First day I was scared. I couldn't even like ask questions. I was scared that I would make mistakes. But then second day, it got easy because my, my supervisor is a very nice person. Every day you, you learn something new and yeah, you get you get comfortable. You find a way through. So I'm normally sitting here, my laptop, my headphones, a cord for my charger over there, and some snacks, and this would basically be me. <laughs> Luckily for us, you receive all the equipment you need, from the headsets to the laptop, and because of our electrical situation, we also do get backup power. This is the power system that we use to work. Usually I just put in the that thing, that adapter thing, and then put it here and then just put my laptop and I only use it for my laptop really and my Wi-Fi. Just put it here and then I'm done. It lasts me for three hours or so. And electricity then comes back after three hours and then I disconnect it, put it back to the electricity. Every day you just kind of see different things from different people. It kind of is motivating, especially in the Eastern Cape where there's no jobs. So that is my favorite one, knowing that somebody out there is going to have an income because of the work that we do. It was not easy, especially at the beginning, but we were able to remedy and fix and adjust things so that the overall experience, the overall interactions with customers was clean, complete, and seamless. This type of work would be possible, but it's taken all the work time to build out that network of support, and thankfully we've come into contact and have worked with a very strong set of people that are on our side. Before I had this job, I was out of Being grateful every day that I have this opportunity keeps me grounded and it also reminds me that these opportunities don't come all the time. But having something to be grateful for is a great motivator and uh, a space for keeping a positive mindset. Definitely would move a lot of people from their lower class of living to middle class. It would create a different market on our side. It would help the municipality on our sides because there's only so much they can do so this would be beneficial for a lot of positive reasons ultimately we're also helping our agents you know in the different countries being able to you know pay for electricity and send their kids to school and really give back to their communities so it just shows you know our culture is all about being employee centric along with customer and client centric. My name is Kanyisi Lekun Sandamu. My name is Vuyo. Nita Adelisa Mokomba. Ilandra Brown. And I am a call center agent at Call Center. Call Zilla. Call Zilla. Call Zilla. Call Zilla. All right, thank you so much for calling. She was speaking to Tutu. Have a lovely day. All right, bye now. <laughs> All right, so I want to just say, uh, Thank you for, for just taking a chance to see what frontline agents' lives are really like. And thank you, Neil, for sharing this glimpse into this side of the world that many don't think about. And the other thing I will say is, 
for you to go to East London, which is not the easiest place in the world to be in or do business, for me to see the lives and the city that you, you've invested in and the effort that you put in to build a business in this way exemplifies so many of the things that I think are so important about what we do. Okay, so if you want to see more of the Empty Echo series, I have a bunch of other ones. You can take a shot of this and uh, you can watch the rest of the YouTube videos. I'm going to be quick here because I want to show you two other, I think, important videos that help you in your, your lives and your careers. All right. I want, to, I want to just tell you these four truths that I know to be true about all of us. Everyone wants to feel value in every interaction, doesn't matter, sales, um, customer care, etc. But this is a value that unifies and binds all of us. We all want to achieve our goals. Emotional engagement is what influences us. And this is the one that I think is a little more nuanced that I've found common all over the world is that enhancing each other's self, sense of self, self-worth is the key. When you enhance the self-worth of someone else, you improve the lives of, of, and, and the performance of all your performance metrics. Okay, now, so here's something that I, that I think was really interesting. I was at the uh, this particular Calling Contact Center Expo last year and I, I was at a booth and I heard about this technology that was supposed to like change the industry, all these crazy stats, it's gonna do this, it's so easy, it makes the agents' lives better, agents love it, brands love it, and I was like, really? So I decided to find out for myself if this technology that showed up at the show was really what they said it was. So I've got big news for you. I just recently came back from Belize doing an investigative reporting style mini documentary on a technology that is gonna transform our entire industry almost overnight. Big claims, I know. To put it all in context, let me roll a clip for you where I first interviewed Ruluca about this technology last year at the Colin Contact Center Expo in Las Vegas. We provide management capabilities using Chromebooks and Chromeboxes for agents to use in a contact center environment. Actually, our agents of Chrome OS are 19% more productive than any other platform. We do that in a way that is super interesting because you can drop ship. So she's making some pretty big claims right now. Agent. We call that zero touch enrollment. So an administrator never has to touch the device. All the agent does is open it up, logs in, and everything is right there. To truly get to the heart of so the story, said, we're going to hit down the productivity, efficiency, the cost, and it's just magic at the Apple Call Center to see the impact. So I want to go find out if it's true. The clients, the agents, what happened, and the communities. The Google Chrome opportunity was really exciting because Google Chrome has a great reputation. Chrome OS aligns perfectly with our strategic vision. There's so many benefits to Chrome OS and Chromebooks that, that we were excited to jump right in. The cost of the hardware is about half or, or less of what our traditional Think hardware costs. So that's good. We immediately did some testing and put them into production. Our current systems, we have a lot of things we have to go through to get them set up and ready to go. This was very seamless. For now, it's, it's really meeting the needs of our client and, and for us in this, this test. They own one that is on their own personal computers now. They want to take the laptops home with them. I still ask the agents every day about, you know, the Google initiative or the Chromebook, how they're working. If I don't hear anything, it's because it's running smooth. So I'm happy with that. At first, I was a bit skeptical because it was something new, but eventually I saw that it was an upgrade for us. The good part about it is it's fast. I would say that I'm really glad that they did make the switch to giving us the Chrome OS because that has helped us a lot, especially with the notifications panel. So now that we're actually in the Chrome OS, we can get both updates from clients and companies. It's very interesting to see this deployment. Agents feel very comfortable moving to the new system because the stability of the Chrome OS operating system interface with the client's softwares and the VPNs and the security much more seamlessly. 
So there is a huge tech advantage. So we saw that productivity increase when they actually started to work on the Chrome OS. So at this point, the client got much excited. She's and responsible for these metrics. We metrics. started to do about two to three times more than what we did on the basic systems that we had previously. It has done just that. I the find that like I can it. see the difference day to day on how many work I get done and the numbers don't lie. Chrome OS helped us in our productivities and our meeting our KPIs and goals. Within a week, we had the entire team on Chrome OS and one, it was a one transition was the after. One was the entire deployment. Something that people need to realize with call centers is the change a lot. So saying that yes, we need to adapt all the time. It's not for efficiency, but again, if the employees are happy, they're reporting it, it's making it so we can all move in the right direction together. Not only customers, the other yeah. female users are also looking at Chrome and AI um, to be integrated into the, into the system and into their services. It's something that we fully encourage and that we support, and I think that it would definitely enhance the productivity within the sector. The job of the BPOs is ensuring that the environment is safe and happy enough to have good conversations on the phone, right? We all know sales and customer service. You, got, you have happy people and they're going to be talking with a smile. With Chrome OS, we've had zero help desk tickets since we've zero, implemented this, which is insane. And then there's also the zero. agent's ability to be more efficient zero. and productive and use the technology that we have. So technology is important to our sustainability as a company and in our growth. So there you have it. Google Chrome OS in the field. It deploys quickly. It creates efficiency. And ultimately, what I'd like to remind you is that when you can reduce your capital costs by 40%, increase your productivity by 100% or more, you change the lives of people. You increase the ability for customer care to do a better job. You improve the socioeconomic fabric of the country. And ultimately, what we do is we create more smiles around the world. Thank you, I'm Dennis. All right. So now, if you want to take a picture of this, if you want to get in touch with Raluca, you can take a picture of this. You can book time directly with her. And now, as you're taking a picture of this, what I'm very happy to do is share with you this final video, which is what the future of the customer and experience is in their entirety when we think about the human values we give ourselves permission to think positively about the world. And I'm gonna just show you the future of customer experience right now. I just got back from filming this. Please enjoy it. Expo 2020 was any expo on steroids at the scale of not 10x, 100x. From the number of countries that participated to the amount of events happening in a day, to the amount of content being created in a day, and all that, put it on one side and then say, you know what, take all that scale and put it during a global pandemic. While still the commitment of the country, the commitment of Expo 2020 management to deliver between 23 to 25 million visits remain. So pre-pandemic, that was the objective. During the pandemic, that remained the objective. Expo 2020 was a six month event, 24 million visitors, an average of 137,000 visitors a day during the six months. But it was always designed to be a part of Dubai that would have a very powerful legacy and, and remain. But the transition into somewhere to live, work and play is far more complicated and it requires you know, deep planning and deep introspection as to exactly what the city will be. So we, we kind of say we've gone from running a six month event to building a city for the next six centuries. As we transition from an event to a city, we need to own board a legacy that relates to the tangibles, the wonderful buildings, the pavilions, right? The city environment, but also the intangibles, the spirit of innovation. 
the optimism, the connectedness. That's the ethos of, of Expo City Dubai. And for, for the space of innovation, it's where we go from a program that invests and supports startups to a city whose ecosystem is designed to help organizations, large and small, prepare for the future. What's really interesting about that is that more and more communities don't want to sit in their own echo chambers. So universities don't just want to speak to university. Or businesses don't just want to speak to businesses. Innovators don't just want to speak to innovators and so on and so forth. What they want is to be able to build a truly effective ecosystem where there's an active agent sort of curating those conversations and enabling further growth to come from those connections. What better place to do it than in Expo City Dubai that has the infrastructure, that has the capability, that has the legislative and regulatory maneuverability to be able to respond to needs Happy of the day. Better. As we begin to, and we are hosting COP, but as COP comes and goes and we welcome more visitors and more tenants, it'll be a very active city and that will be sort of a real, a really ripe opportunity to build those sorts of connections and, and drive different kinds of change. That. I think for, for us as EC, ECD, as Expo City Dubai, our starting place for the, the planning and our involvement into hosting, being the, the venue host for COP28, was really the legacy. For us, there was no point in looking at this as a, as a two-week event. Um, if we're really talking true sustainability, we need to talk about the legacy of what COP28 can leave behind, both in a, a macro strategic political sense, but also in a very tangible tactical level in our site. As Expo City Dubai, COP28 provides really an incentive, an excuse, a reason to really improve our game in so many different ways. And I don't know, I think I'm by nature addicted to challenges. So it's never been easy, right? And you put me in a place that is always becoming more difficult and always surprising you. I survive and I think everyone who's here is the same. We're all uh, approaching this in the same manner. And the size of the project and the ambition and what it is in, in how it serves humanity is extremely important and gives us purpose and drive. All of us in the world of marketing, brand, customer experience, commerce and everything, we all know the power of purpose. And we did a lot of work after Expo closed on what would be our purpose as a city. And we feel our legacy is about being part of propelling humanity. And when you do that, you begin to understand the world in a more authentic way. To a certain degree, we're very much the same. And we're all working towards the same goals, but at the exact same time, we're unique, we're different, we're contextual. And I've had a chance to, 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 to experience that, to find a commonality, turn that into a goal, and then find a difference and find it beautiful wherever you are in the world, and if you are interested in an opportunity to establish yourself or build a relationship with an, with an outpost in Dubai, then come and talk to us at the City Dubai. All right, so that's the future. I'll leave you with this last thought. The global voice of CX is 180,000 people now. You are all part of the global voice of CX. You can be the plus one. If you'd like to join the community, you can take a picture of this. I'm Dennis Wakabayashi, thank you for your time.